Dear congregation, let us turn in God's holy word to the epistle of James, James chapter 1. You can find it on page 1849 in your pew Bible, 1849. And we'll read James 1, especially in light of our text from Matthew 13, where we are taught to pray. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That will be our text and theme for the day. I'd like to read James 1, especially as it regards to temptation. Let us hear the word of the Lord, James chapter 1. James, a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with, a, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation but the rich in his humiliation, because as the flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass. It, its flower fails and its beauty appearance, beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of God does not produce the righteousness of God. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this, one, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word. Let us also confess what we 
I believe regarding the sixth petition and the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer that he taught us to pray. Lord's Day 52. Lord's Day 52, you can find it in the back of your Psalter on page 87. Question 127, which is the sixth petition. Answer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, since we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment, and besides this, since our mortal enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, cease not to assault us, do therefore preserve, strengthen us by the word of thy Holy Spirit, that we may not be overcome in this spiritual warfare, but constantly and strenuously may resist our foes till at last we obtain a complete victory. Question 128. How do you conclude your prayer? Answer. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. That is, all these we ask of you, because you, being our King and Almighty, are willing and able to give us all good. And all this we pray for, that thereby, not we, but your holy name may be glorified forever. Question 129. What does the word amen signify? Answer, amen signifies it shall truly and certainly be for my prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart that I desire these things of him. As far as we confess regarding the last petition and the conclusion of our Lord's prayer. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we near the end of the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, we recognize that we have already looked at three petitions that is, or two petitions that, that we focus on praying for ourselves. First of all, our daily bread, Secondly, the forgiveness of our sins, but also closely tied to that, the need for not being led into temptation and to be delivered from the evil one. We'd like to look at that with our theme for this day, limiting ourselves this morning to lead us not into temptation, recognizing the great need for a hatred for sin a desire to follow Christ, to be sanctified more and to become more and more Christ-like in our lives. And it is true that if we do not abide in prayer and pray earnestly this petition, lead us not into temptation, that our human nature will only allow us to abide in temptation. And so we need to be daily in intercession before God on behalf of ourself and on behalf of others. God, preserve our souls. Keep our hearts that our ways might not be entangled in sin and in this world. I'd like to look at this then this morning. Lead us not into temptation. First of all, recognizing the great danger of temptation. Secondly, briefly looking at God's design for temptation. And thirdly, the discipline required in temptation. The thing, first of all, then the danger of temptation. What is temptation? What is Jesus? saying when he teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Well, the word temptation in the Greek here, and especially also found in James chapter 1, we find temptation has maybe a broader meaning than what we, what we may think it means. 
It can mean temptation into sin or a test or a trial even. As James points out, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's the very same word for temptation. And even though it may seem confusing in our minds that James would say, count it all joy when you fall into trials or temptations, when Jesus himself is teaching us to pray, lead us not into temptation. And so we need to properly understand the, the full range of meaning of this word. And we need to come to a clear biblical theology of what temptation is is and how God tests us and Satan himself tempts us. In other words, what James is saying here when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, he's not saying when you fall into the temptation to sin. Temptation here also as Jesus teaches us to pray would be that which entices us and seduces us and allures us. It, in a certain way, it tantalizes us with the desire of sin. Well, that's far different than a trial that's set before us that, that James is speaking of here in verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials because we ought never to count it joy when we fall into sin. The desire for sin is sin. That's as simple as that. As a matter of fact, later on, he points out very clearly in verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. The very same word that's used. Because then he is approved and he will receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Because they've endured through it, they've fought against it, and they did not succumb to its attraction, attractiveness and its enticing allurements. Maybe we can just simply illustrate this. That'll help clarify it. There are many good gifts that God gives us in life. Many good gifts. Just think of one of them. You can apply this to many good gifts that God gives. One of them would be food. We all need food to eat and to, be, and to be cared for and to be nourished. That's a good gift from God. It's a real trial when we don't have enough. But it's also a trial when we have too much. And that's why we find Agar praying in Proverbs 30, give me neither poverty nor riches, because both have their allurements. It's a good gift of God, food and material uh, wealth and whatever, but they can both be a trial. And God will test us by those trials. When we don't have enough, then the temptation is that you will steal. And when you have too much, then you will be discontent and you will also blaspheme God. You will only want more and you will abuse the good gifts that God has given. And so the trial in itself is not sinful. It's a test from God to see whether we will be obedient to him, yes or no, and how we will handle ourselves in the midst of that trial. And in that sense, temptation is not sin. In that sense, the trial itself is not sin. Poverty is not sin. Riches are not sin. But it's the temptations that come along with those trials that can lead us into sin. And we're praying, lead us not into sin through the very trials that are ordained for our good in life. Another very contemporary illustration would be sexuality. God has given the good gift of sexuality within the bonds of marriage. And within the bonds of marriage, we are called to, to rejoice in this good gift of God. But the challenge comes when this good gift of God 
is perverted. Whether it be in premarital sex, whether it be in pornography and fulfilling the lust of our flesh, whether it be in homosexual lust and desires. You see, we all have a trial, every one of us. The trial comes when our desires are not being fulfilled in a God-honoring way. And we are then tempted and allured and attracted by our desires and the perversion of them. Many times in our day and age, even Christians have warped through language the understanding of temptation here. Especially when it comes to the perversion of sexuality. It is indeed a trial to be a heterosexual. And it is a trial when some people may have homosexual tendencies. But when you start defining it and redefining words to say same-sex attraction as if that's not sinful, you are saying the very attraction of sexuality in its perversion is not sinful and that is wrong. It's as clear as that. Because desire and the lust of it and the enticement of it is sinful. It's sinful. It's as, it's as clear as that. The desires of sexuality in any way that it's not ordained by God who has created us good and perfect is sinful. That should be absolutely clear. But with new terminology, it's not always so clear any longer, even within the Christian church. And we need to recognize the grave danger of temptation and attraction and lust. Because we are prone to lust after sin. We are prone to fall into sin. And that's not God's fault. As a matter of fact, James says, let no one say when he is tempted, he is tempted by God. It's not God who does the tempting. It's our own wicked hearts depraved by sin that leads us into sin and leads us into the attractiveness of the temptations that come our way. We need to realize that we are absolutely weak in ourselves and we could not stand for one moment except for the grace of God. Because when temptation comes in and we believe in the depravity of man and the sinfulness of man, we realize that we will give in to temptation. No pastor, no elder, no deacon, no Sunday school teacher, no school, no congregation, even wearing its absolute Sunday best, is above this. We are all prone to sin. And temptation exposes our weakness. It's like temptation comes and it should be a danger sign with capital letters in red, bold letters. There's grave danger in temptation. Because we need to recognize the very mortal enemies that produce temptation. Yes, God suffers us to have trials. But there's mortal enemies that tempt us in the midst of these trials. The first one is Satan himself. The evil one who has much power and yet 
is not omnipotent. Yes, who has much knowledge, but is not all-knowing. However, we need to recognize that he has great experience. And he has his fingers on the pulse of our depravity and our sinfulness. We need to know that he knows the very thoughts and the imaginations and the intents of our minds and our hearts. He has 6,000 years of experience. And he loves to tempt us. And he loves to tempt the people of God especially. Especially when their faith is just new. And he brings all kinds of accusations against them. He sometimes tempts us. Even when we are feeling as if we're on cloud nine and our faith is the strongest. Because that's when he knows that we are the most vulnerable to sin. He tempts us when we're on holidays in a different environment. He tempts us when we come to the fires of affliction and we don't know where to turn and we're sleepless and tired and burnt out and persecuted and, and exhausted. He comes and He tempts us. He tempts us in our weakest moments. He comes to put thoughts into our minds. And then he blames us even for thinking of them. And we need to recognize we are no match for Satan. He knows and understands our sinfulness. Because it's his evil that we are all born in. Second mortal enemy is the world itself. And all of its sensuality. Think of the media today and its influence in our lives. It's difficult to live in this world as a church. And we're called to live in this world. But the world ought never to be in us as God's people. You see, living in the world is like a ship floating on the ocean. There's no problem with the ship floating on the ocean. Actually, the ocean holds it up. And the world does. It holds us up. It provides us with basic needs, doesn't it? It cares for us in many ways. Physically, God uses the world to care for Christians. But the problem is, is when the world gets in the church. It's just like when the water gets in the ship. What happens to the ship? It sinks and becomes overwhelmed in the world. You see, dear congregation, after the fall, we realize that all of the trees of this world have been affected by sin. And we live in the orchard of Satan. Adam lived in the orchard of God, where there was only one tree that he was forbidden to eat of, the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Today, there's only one tree for us to eat of, the tree of life, Jesus Christ. And the orchards of this world and the orchard are the orchards of Satan. The fruit of evil. And the world, in all of its allurements and attractiveness and promises, will only lead to nothing. As a matter of fact, James even says that, that the rich man, he, he will have nothing at the end. It will all be gone as a flower fails and its beauty and appearance perishes the rich man will also fade away in all his pursuits. The world has nothing to offer for eternity. It's a mortal enemy that poisons us every time we eat the fruit of it. 
our own flesh is a mortal enemy. Maybe even the worst enemy of all. When we don't understand our own weakness, that is a recipe for disaster. And it can be a mortal enemy that consumes us. And a mortal enemy that deprives even the people of God of such blessedness and happiness in the Lord. You see, because there's two lions. There's two lions, isn't there? One that goes about like a prowling lion, Satan himself, that comes to seek to devour. And then there's the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ. And even for a Christian, anointed by his spirit, we fight that good fight of faith because those lions are roaring within us. There was one child who asked his dad if there's two lions within us. Which one will win? And his dad said this. The lion who you feed will win. In other words, if you are feeding, feeding in your own depravity, in your own pride, in your own lustfulness, if you are feeding in the things of the world and you are feeding in the temptations of Satan, in the orchards of Satan, that lion will win. But if you are feeding on Christ, if you are feeding on the word of God, that lion will win. Isn't that exactly what happened to Cain and Abel? Cain began to feed on his envy, his frustrations, and his desire to be accepted by God on his own merits. And it led to the murder of Abel. Abel was feeding on a relationship with God and worship of God. Yes, he died, but the lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed in his life, even before he came. You see, dear congregation, it is so much easier to fall into temptation than it is to stand firm in faithfulness. I trust even the children can understand it takes a lot more energy for me to pull back from just falling over the ledge when I put my foot over the ledge like that. It takes a lot of energy to, to hold yourself up. It'd be much easier just to tumble down the steps. That's what it is. That's what temptation is. We need to fight it, resist it, flee from it. And pray, lead us not into temptation. And yet, secondly, we realize that God has a design in temptation. God has a design in temptation. Because God has designed trials and afflictions for our good. And he allows Satan even and the world... To test us by them. You see, we need to remember that God tries and Satan tempts. And even those trials that God uses are, are means whereby Satan and this world can tempt us. Thomas Watson wrote this, The devil tempts, tempts that he may deceive, but God suffers us to be tempted in order to try us. And to test us. That's the very 
That's, that's the full understanding of this word temptation. God is trying us to test our sincerity even through temptation at times. Yet God is not the author of evil and he's not the author of the temptations. You see, God's design for temptation is to draw out the good work that he's worked in us by the power of his grace. And the strength that he gives us. And in doing so, he seeks to refine us. Where Satan, on the other hand, uses it to stir up evil in us. And deprive us from the good gifts that God has given us spiritually. And so therefore, James rightly calls temptations or trials of God as occasions of joy. Of joy. Because when we practice the graces of God in our lives, He is exercising us and giving us an experience of a relationship with Him. In the midst of trials and afflictions and even temptations, the Lord is assuring us of His help. And that he won't even lay upon us any kind of affliction, any kind of temptation, more than what we can handle and bear. Especially when we rely on his strength. As a matter of fact, Paul writes to the 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. You see, then what God is doing is he's making us more and more Christ-like. As we experience even the very temptations that he has gone through. And to remember that Christ himself endured those temptations absolutely perfectly. And he makes us more and more Christ-like. John Trapp wrote, reading, it makes someone who, a man who is full, full of, full of knowledge. And, and prayer, it makes a man holy, set apart to, to serve the Lord. But temptation, he says, makes a man experienced. Experienced. Because we are exercised through temptation. So we pray, Father, exercise us, discipline us, disciple us. But that in no wise suggests that we should run into temptation. Because temptation itself, says John Owen, is like a knife. It either will cut meat in order to feed you, or it will cut the throat of man. It's either your food or your poison. If God suffers us to be tried and tested and even tempted, then it can be for our good. But if we succumb to temptation and see its attractiveness and its desire, it's our poison. Therefore, we need to be disciplined. And that's why, as we conclude, we need to see the discipline required in temptation. It's our third point, the discipline in temptation. Discipline includes exercise. If you were training for a marathon, you need to exercise. You need to be in the training ground, in the gym. You need to be running. And so God also disciplines his people by exercising them and training them. As a matter of fact, you think about how God had allowed the Canaanites to stay in the land of Israel. And you wonder, why didn't God just drive out all of those Canaanites and make sure that none of those Canaanites would ever bother Israel again and they could enjoy the promised land 
And they would never sin against God because, because God, God was with them and, and they were serving Him faithfully. And they wouldn't be caused to trip up by these Canaanites. And yet God, we find in Judges 2, had a very specific purpose for leaving the Canaanites in Israel. Even though He told them to drive them out, God allowed them to stay in order, He says in Judges 2, verse 22, so that I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord and walk in them or not. Judges 3, verse 4, he says, They were left that he might test Israel to know whether to obey and to train them in warfare. And so there's discipline, train, discipline, training, and exercise going on. You're going to go off to fight a battle in a war, a just war. You're going to need to know your weapons. You're going to be need to train in them. You're going to need to know what kind of weapons they are, what kind of bullets they are, what kind of ballistics those bullets have. You're going to need to know it all. And we also need to know the weapons that God gives us and how to exercise them. We need to be trained in warfare. Even prayer, lead us not into temptation, is part of that Christian warfare, according to Ephesians 6. Faith, as James points out, we need faith. We need to exercise wisdom with faith. We need faith. We need, we need, the, we need the Word of God, even as Jesus illustrates. When he was led in the Spirit into the wilderness and the tempter came. It says, after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating anything, just turn that stone into bread and you can eat. You have the power to do so, says, says Satan. Jesus says, no, 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 no. And he takes the word of God. It says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from God. The word of God is our weapon and we need to know how to use it. We need to be trained in it, exercised in it, in all of the Christian armor. Equipped as Christian soldiers, trained as Christian soldiers. That's how true leaders were born. They were born even on the anvil of affliction. You think of Abraham, you think of Job, you think of Peter. All equipped. And trained through temptation. If you're going to fight in a war, or you're going to run a marathon, you're going to need to learn to deny yourself. To deny yourself. Isn't that what training does? Many times in our own life when we're training for something like that, you need to have the proper food. You need to have the proper rest and the proper exercise. And in order to do so, you need to deny yourself your desires. And so also temptation, it teaches us self-denial. It's a lot easier just to float along down the stream of this world than to, than to swim up against the current of our time. It takes self-denial. James says it, it creates in us patience. Patience is exercise. And when, when our faith is tested, it produces patience. No, the trial is not necessarily joyous in the moment, but as it's exercised, we understand the joyous fruits of the Spirit of patience but also submission and dependence upon God. We realize that it's God who needs to preserve us from temptation. And so therefore we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Even as you bring trials in our life, Lord, preserve us from the tempting influences of those trials. And use those trials for my growth and for my good. Disciple me, discipline me, O oh Lord. 
that I might grow in grace and in knowledge of who you are, that I might further crucify my old nature, denying the pleasures of this world for a time, and patiently waiting upon you, my only rock. Oh Lord, I know I'm depraved, but Father, exercise me that I might be a fit Christian, prepared for warfare, and prepared prepared to serve you all the days of my life. Lord, preserve me from being a sputtering, compromising Christian. That's what we're praying. That's how we're disciplined. You only discipline yourself because you know you're weak. If you thought you could just run a marathon and be the winner, you wouldn't need to go to the gym. You wouldn't need to be running every day. You wouldn't need to be eating right. You wouldn't be needing to deny yourself anything. Because you got it all right. But the problem is, understanding this petition begins with understanding our weakness. Charles Spurgeon once told a story about a man who received mercy and grace and in the midst of his weakness. It was in the days of the Reformation. There was two men who were condemned to die at the hands of Queen Mary. And they were going to die at the stake of fire. The one man was boasting ah, that he could go to the stake. And he could give his life for Christ. And he was desirous to give his life for Christ. And he was boasting to the inmates that he could stand firm. He would never deny his faith. His companion in prison was weeping, trembling, Fearful, he would deny his master. Fearful that when the flames would be rising, he would, he would deny the Lord Jesus. And he asked this proud man, please pray for me. And they spent much time, he spent much time weeping over his weakness and crying to God for strength. As the day came when the stake was prepared and the fires were lit. The proud, boastful man looked at the fire and renounced his faith. But the weak soul I cried to God, understanding his own weakness, stood firm, singing and praising God as he was burnt to ashes. When I am weak, then I am strong. Because the discipline always points us to Jesus Christ and our need to pray. Lead us not into temptation. Other than the story, remind us of Peter. And Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny, my, to deny me. And Peter says, I will never deny you. I will go to death with you. Jesus says, pray not to be led into temptation. And they come to Gethsemane. And Jesus goes and prays, submitting to the will of his Father in heaven. As he prays that he would take this cup from him. Sweating great drops of blood. And there sits Peter proud and arrogant 
sleeping. No need for prayer. A couple hours later, standing in the hall of Caiaphas, he denies his master not once, not twice, but three times. Do you hear the rooster crowing this morning? Do you think you can endure temptation? Do you think you have power and strength and endurance in yourself to fight the mortal enemies of Satan of this world and your own depravity? Then hear the rooster crowing. And remember what Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For he has the power to refine us even in the midst of temptation and to glorify his name when we stand firm by his grace in the midst of of affliction and temptation. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord, lead us not into temptation. Because Lord, by nature, we would just fall right into it. Be pleased, O God, to forgive us and strengthen us and preserve us from all the mortal enemies that come up against us and preserve us from our own selves, our own pride, our own selfishness, our own boastfulness, and bring us in weakness before you that we might know the power of Christ resting upon us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.